Species Resumption Act, that is where the populists come in because these were farmers, right? These are Western farmers and miners too. And what they find is that the their debts, because of the gold standard, the debt they have gets to be crushing because they, they borrowed paper dollars and they're going to pay back gold dollars. That's one side. And the other side is the prices they're getting for their goods go down, down, down. So that is the populist movement. I urge people to take a look at the populist platform of Omaha in 1890. Those are the roots of the New Deal. Many of the concepts, such as parity price for farmers, come from the uh, populist and are then taken up in the New Deal. And then by the time we get to this century, it's quite obvious. It's Franklin D. Roosevelt, the New Deal. The first time in human history that the middle class has become the numerical majority of the entire society. And this is the society, the New Deal state, the New Deal society, that fought off communism, fascism, and Nazism, put a person on the moon, and, and unlocked the secrets of the atom. It is the most, ex most effective form of human organization yet devised. Kennedy tried to revive it with the new frontier. He was assassinated by Wall Street finance oligarchs working through the CIA operations director. We also should mention LBJ, right? Johnson, in his domestic program, especially Medicare and civil rights, this is also a continuation. Unfortunately, he fell for the Vietnam War line, and that is what destroyed him. Since the coming of Nixon, right? And we just had, we just had the 40th anniversary of Watergate this past weekend. Since the coming of Nixon, the American system, as we had it, has been dismantled. And this is what people have to understand. This Austrian litany of deregulation, privatization, union busting, the race to the bottom, the destruction of the social safety net, that is what has lowered the American standard of living by two thirds over the past 40 years or so. So this is what I stand for. It is the American system. It's not foreign. Austrianism, by, by contrast, right, this this uh, libertarian Austrian doctrine of von Mises and von Hayek, you'd have to say, what is that? Where does that come from? Well, it doesn't really even come from Austria. I guess that would be bad enough, but it comes from the London School of Economics. That is where von Mises and von Hayek got their, their leap into international prominence. And above all, what people need to know is that Austrianism and libertarianism, that is a synthetic doctrine designed to brainwash people, to get them to the point where they cannot see their own interests and they're eager to cut their own throats. All right, let's this, stop right there because I'm going to... Hold on, Webster, I have to announce to the network, we're going to skip this break coming up here in about a minute and a half so you can finish. You can get into your indictment. I want to get your perspective on this, but I want to go back. Why do I see out of the New Deal types... Wanting to restrict my Second Amendment, wanting to raise taxes on the middle class, and that money always getting siphoned off to the crony capitalist monopoly men. Why do I see the big tax-free foundations, Ford, Carnegie, lobbying? I understand for both sides. that They are trying to control the libertarian movement so that they can grow a big government and then absolve themselves from taxes and take control of the wreckage. But I think it's more sophisticated than just saying, oh my gosh, we need to go with this new deal system. All I see the, the, the inheritance of the New Deal doing is coming after my Second Amendment and my family and trying to make me dependent. I think that's that's too much of a low-level view, and I, I don't see how you can blame the New Deal for things that have happened since about No, no, but I'm saying what came out of it. I mean, well, you know, the, the, the Great Society, all of this. Yeah, what came out of it was... First of all, that the United States did not succumb to Nazism and fascism. Remember that Roosevelt was the leading anti-fascist of the world. He was the only person who consistently opposed fascism and Okay, Nazism. well, I want you to get into that, but, but let's go back to your point about the libertarians being synthetic. Yeah, look, if you look you, we look at Peter Thiel, right? Peter Thiel of the Bilderberg uh, uh, Steering Committee gives $2.7 million to the Ron Paul campaign. What does this mean? It means precisely that libertarianism and Austrianism is a the synthetic ideology designed to get people to cut their own throats. We can also go back. David Rockefeller, this was the funny thing about that scene at the, at the Bilderberg. David Rockefeller was, was, of course, not there. I guess he's too sick. But the, the patron, historically, of the Bilderberger group is David Rockefeller. There's some good news he, that he's getting ready to die. That's he, some he pays a lot of the bills. Yeah, but now you're going to get Thiel, and Thiel is actually worse. So David Rockefeller is, is paying for what's going on inside, but outside there are people who say, I'm, I'm a libertarian, I'm an Austrian, I'm for Ron Paul. That doctrine is also 
uh, uh, subsidized, paid for by David Rockefeller. He paid von Hayek. Von Hayek had to spoon feed him economics when David Rockefeller was studying at the London School of Economics, and he paid von Mises. The, the, the most dangerous secret organization for your listeners is not Bilderberg, not Trilateral, not Skull and Bones. It's the Mount Pelerin Society. The Mount Pelerin Society, founded in Switzerland in 1947, with Milton Friedman, von Hayek, I think, was there, uh, right-wing CIA with William Buckley, European feudal nobility. In other words, the ideological basis, the theoretical basis of Bilderberg and, and the things that come later is already laid in 1947. The Volcker Fund gets involved. Uh, there are books about this, right? How reactionary and fascist businessmen supported this stuff. They funded it and promoted it. Well, sure, it. let's go they back. I mean, you've got the Rockefellers funding uh, Hitler from the beginning. All that's on record and declassified. But let's go right. back because we have that private discussion because y you could see it, it's on record. The, the very same robber barons funded uh, Marx, Engels, the whole deal. Explain how Marxism is synthetic as well and what's yeah. the synthesis between the, the, the libertarianism they want to control, and, and you could argue began, uh, and and the communism. What is because that's what the Carnegie documents show is they do say there's a synthesis. What is it? Well, we want to break out of it, but let's let's go back. I think I'm the foremost critic of Marx. Right, my thesis is that Marx was a British agent, and you can see this in stuff that I published uh, in 1994, 1995. Marx operated out of uh, Great Britain. Right, everybody knows that he studied at the reading room of the British Museum. Right, today the British Library. His patron was a guy called David Urquhart. David Urquhart had been the British ambassador to uh, the Ottoman Empire, right, to Turkey, to, to Constantinople. And this guy, Urquhart, had a newspaper, and Marx earned his money, not so much from the New York Herald Tribune, but from this newspaper of David Urquhart. Uh, Urquhart is the guy who told Marx the plan for Das Kapital, right, capital, the, the, the uh, main work of, uh, of Marx. Urquhart was interested in dialectics. Urquhart had classes for working people. And this, the funny thing about it is that Urquhart was a tremendous hater of Russia. And people may not remember this, but even in the 50s and 60s, it was an embarrassment to the Soviets to have Marx as their guru. But at the same time, when you look at what Marx actually writes, it's always attacking Russia. Well, well, exactly, and they sent that 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 biological political weapon in 1917. It's not your thesis. Anthony Sutton got the documents. There were congressional hearings on it. So McCarthy discovered it and then was destroyed. That that the entire time the Department of War, everything sent hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, the one train of gold with 50 million uh, with Lenin on board in to overthrow the czars. Uh, because they knew there was already a revolution going on in Russia. I mean, communism was sent from England and the United States by the robber barons. Yes, uh, although, uh, let me just say, uh, Marx was acting as a typical British agent in the 19th century when the main enemies of Great Britain were Russia and the United States. And indeed, during the American Civil War, there's a convergence between Lincoln and the Tsar as the good guys, in my view, when the Russian fleet arrived in New York, the Russian fleet arrived in San Francisco, and the British knew in 1863, if you attack the United States, you get a world war with the United States, Russia, probably Prussia, against Britain, France, and Spain. And by the way, people forget this, and then they say, Alex, you're from the South. What do you mean you say the North's good? No, 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 no. Uh, on record, they this is they sent British intelligence in to foment the South, who had real grievances, to try to break the country up. I mean, this is what they do. Right. Uh, Freemasonic agitators, very relevant point. But now, when we look at Lenin, uh, Lenin is someone who was sent in by the British and by the U.S. to create chaos, the, the trick was now uh, Lenin turns into the Frankenstein principle. In other words, they say, let's promote the breakup of the Tsarist empire and, and feast on the, uh, on the remains. And then Lenin, uh, being this fanatic that he was, was able to, to pull a coup and, and carry out a, uh, uh, well, to create this dictatorship, which then turned into something different. But no matter how much it evolved under Stalin, it was always crippled by Marxist doctrine. And the crippling was... 
that they didn't have small and medium industry. They didn't have individual initiative, right? They didn't have entrepreneurship. And this then the needed. CIA in 49 now declassified, I'd always read this and seen this, they now admit in the last five years, put Mao Zedong into power, who destroyed all small and medium, collectivized and right. killed 60 plus mil. Well, this, that, of course, is the British policy, right? The British had always hated Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese nationalists. But what, what was going on there, this was actually done by General Marshall. And this, it gets back to my thesis about Pearl Harbor. You have this group of Stimson, Bundy, Lovett, and McCloy. These are the top uh, leaders of the U.S. banking establishment that enter. They enter the Roosevelt administration as part of a national unity government to wage World War II. They sabotage Roosevelt. They make Pearl Harbor a reality. And then they send General Marshall, who is a willing tool, to China. And what does he do? He cuts off all military aid to Chiang Kai-shek for a year and a half so that Mao will win. Yes, indeed. Mao was put there because Mao was programmed with British ideology, Bentham and Darwin and things like this. And he uh, then he kept China in a state of backwardness. Once Mao was dumped in the, in the 70s, you get the immediate economic development of China. The economic development of China is also a monument to the American system. And again, no, no, exactly. But, but uh, expanding on that, just backing up what you're saying, uh, that's why leading up to this, the British had gone in using opium on record uh, hundreds of years previous to take over China. I mean, this really is a, a, a global system of sabotage, but it's not a thesis. This is all, this is all on record, uh, Tarpley. So sure, and just on the opium, what you just mentioned, the opium was run by the British East India Company. And they had a school of economists associated with them. David Ricardo, the founder of so-called British classical economics, was the boss of the British East India Company. In other words, he was the British, the biggest dope pusher in the world. James Mill, John Stuart Mill, and other British economists of the time, generally funded by the British East India Company, Malthus. Malthus is, of course, the, uh, the ancestor of Keynes. British East India Company cadre school. And, and let's Ricardo. expand British East India Company, 1832, after they'd been kicked out of the U.S. Uh, and the nationalists had defeated them, they sent a giant scout ship or mothership that was skull and bones funded off of opium money on record. Right. And these are the, these are the families that go into the, the, the Boston and New York uh, banking establishment. But here, Ricardo originated the quantity theory of money. The modern representatives of the quantity theory of money are von Hayek, von Mises, and libertarianism. And this obsession, I heard yesterday you were, you were having to fight off people wanting to talk about narcotics, right, and how great narcotics were. This is, you can see this as a kind of original sin of this school of economics, right, the Austrians and the libertarians, which is that they, just like George Soros, are obsessed with making narcotics available everywhere, as if the American people weren't. And what do they say? Enough. What do they say? What do they say? Me gold. Yeah, me gold. Me gold. That's the the leprechaun and uh, the the leprechaun, especially the leprechaun. I think leprechaun five, lip in the hood, out to do no good. That's Ron Paul. Narcotics and gold. <laughs> Take a look. It's an interesting parody. Yeah, but give it with the full power, Tarpley. Right, you, you let me talk a little bit. Now, let me just make my, my action point. We now have a situation.